Okay, so we are back. We are back. This is lecture three of the Dark Knight series. And if you haven't seen lecture one, then that will be up here. But if you have followed along for this whole time, you are in for a treat for this lecture because now we're going to start to... So I just established a principle in the last lecture, right? The principle that I established was, um, was there. Are, imagine there's a spectrum, right? There's a spectrum between the Moana extreme and the Moana extreme is essentially, we'll say, putting too much strain on your unconscious or too much strain on your animalistic desires, versus having the will, having the strength to overcome your. Um, to overcome those animalistic desires. And this is something that we play with every single day. You know, you ask the question, it's like, okay, how can I, let's see, I'm looking around, how can I clean my room, right? If you're asking, how can I clean my room? You're not going to say, okay, every single day, my room is going to look absolutely spotless, right? This is the Moana, this is the Moana extreme, right? So you're not going to say, okay, I'm going to Make sure every single thing is off the floor. I'm going to clean all the desks. Make sure everything looks completely spotless, all the clothes folded, everything. Uh, my bed is made tomorrow, right? You're not going to say that because it's too much strain, right? It's too much. It's taxing on. It's too much of a change, right? And whenever you have this change, we create this sort of joker figure. That's the fundamental problem that we're running into. But yet we understand that, wait a second, if I'm going to clean my room, I'm going to have to make some change, right? I can't just, I can't just keep going as I was going before and expect some sort of change. That's what obviously Einstein would explain as insanity, right? So what happens is you need to have the willpower to make a change and stick with it, right? To make a rule and stick with it. And that's what we're going to be discovering with Batman. And that's what Alfred talks about when he says, endure Master Wayne, right? You're going to, you're going to be experiencing this sort of turbulence whenever you go through this, this pr idea of sticking to a principle but you have to endure it. You have to go through it. You have to stick through this turbulence because if you don't, then you're never going to make any sort of change. And well, this is this is the idea that we that we essentially we came to a principle. We came to a rule at the end of this, and we said, don't make it don't make it too taxing on your unconscious. Don't make it too taxing on your animalistic desires or your, in this case, laziness. Right, but make a change that you can actually make because one of the one of the biggest problems that i see amongst myself and and a bunch of other people you know especially the entrepreneur types they say you know i'm going to go big i'm going to go big or go home i'm going to work 80 hours a week i'm going to go hard and i'm going to i'm going to make this huge change in my life because i haven't been acting in the way that i that i really want to be acting and then the next day you you look at your schedule and you planned out that you were going to work for 14 hours a day. And then you're like, wait a second, I don't want to work 14 hours a day. So the thing that actually happened in my life is whenever I see my schedule says 14 hours a day, I just work for zero. I naturally work for zero because I'm like, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go and do that. You know, it's, that sounds like a miserable day. Therefore I just ditch the schedule altogether. So what's the answer? The answer is sort of negotiating with yourself, working with yourself, but still having this sort of change. And if you want to look look up the neurobiological mechanisms behind this, look up the idea of neuroplasticity, right? The, the idea behind that is literally as you go and experience this turbulence, this stress, it's a stressful time, it's a miserable time, right? You're literally dealing with the joker inside of you. As you're doing that, your brain is actually changing. Your brain actually changes in size, shape, neurological connections. All of these things are happening, and you can imagine it like growing pains. Your brain is actually growing, not in a not in a like swelling sense, but little parts of it are growing, and little connections are forming, and um, and that's painful, right? Your body's going through a physical change as you try to establish any form of habit, any form of structure, any form of discipline, and um, and it's not easy. It's not easy, right? So, um, so the answer here, the answer that that um, that Alfred offers here is you need to endure. You need to go through the turbulence because if you can't have the strength, the will to make it through, then you're never going to make any sort of change in your life. And he's right to every degree. And I really wanted to dig into this idea to get started, you know, and, and really solidify it in your mind, you know, the idea of willpower, 
willpower is a finite resource. It's it's an idea in psychology called ego depletion, and um, and the idea is is really strongly represented in our archetypes, right? The idea that the the part of us that we know, right, the part of us that we embody, and that's that's the ego, right? And I, I established this last time. It's the part of you that plans, and it's the part of you that executes willfully, right? So you imagine you make a schedule, right? You plan for 14 hours, that was your ego talking, and then you, well, if you execute the 14 hours, then that's your ego talking, right? But if you um, if you don't execute it, then obviously your, we'll say Garfield is taking over, your animal side, your laziness is taking over, or whatever representation you want to have for the Joker. So, um, so the, the problem is, right, the problem is this ego, this, this part of us that plans and acts is a very, very bad actor. It doesn't act in the way that we want it to. And you'll look at this in your own life. Like, ask the question, do you always do the things that you want to do? And, well, spend one day actually tracking the things that you do, and you'll realize that the, the day that you think you had is not the day that you actually had. Or if you're really real with yourself, then you'll realize that the day that you actually had is not the day that you wanted. So what is the... That's why That's why you sort of... um. That's why we have this little side integration technique. So, and I wanted to, I wanted to, um, embody these characters and, and help you really understand, you know, the representation behind why ego and willpower is really finite. And it, it actually is summed up in, in these villains, these villains in different Disney movies and other movies. Are these all Disney? No, no, this isn't Disney, but here's Prince Farquaad. And what is Prince Farquaad? You know, I think he's like the He's like the legendary short villain, right? And um, and everybody knows Prince Farquaad as the guy. They always make fun of him because he's short. And you ask the question, right? Obviously, he's a evil dictator, ruler in um, in Shrek. And you ask the question, why is he short? The reason why he's short is because he has no power, right? He's he's an embodiment of the ego. He's an embodiment of somebody who's very egotistical. Yet he has no power. He has no oomph. There's nothing that really um well, has the will to actually make decisions. He just kind of talks, right? That's his thing. And, um, and that's, that's the ego within us, right? Our ego talks. It has a big mouth. It says, I'm going to work 14 hours tomorrow. I'm going to do it. But then actually executing that, that decision is really, really difficult. And that's why all of these characters, you know, so I'll take you through. So there's the, there's this boss in Ratatouille, right? This is uh, the rat's boss, and he's also a short boss, right? A short leader. Same thing in the Incredibles. You have a short leader. All these people are midgets, and um, the question is, why are they midgets? Why are they tiny? And um, and the answer is clearly because they have a big mouth. They could plan, and they're very good at planning, yet they have no executing power. There is actually in the Incredibles the um, the the main character is uh is mr incredibles who's like jacked you know he's known for his super strength and what he does is the boss tells him to do something and mr incredible takes him grabs him and throws him through the wall because you know he's he's tiny right he has he has no he has no power and you ask the question it's like what is that a representation of that's the representation of the boss tries to make a plan right the the part of you wants to make a plan i want to go to the gym i want to go and I want to quit smoking. I want to, you know, establish a relationship. I want to do this, 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 establish a career, whatever. And then your unconscious desires, your actual, the part of you that acts is a good way of saying it, which is a lot more simple than just willfully acting. The part of you that acts just takes him and throws him to the wall because he has no, these short villains, these short leaders, they might be the leaders, but yet they have no power to act. And, um, and well, that's the representation within you. So now we're going to watch as Batman struggles with this, right? This is the exact idea that Batman struggles with. He's going to say, how can I endure? How can the part of me that plans unite with the part of me that acts? And, um, and how can I have the willpower to push through? Those are the same sentences. So, um, so you got to ask the question, right? What is the Joker's demands, right? It starts with the Joker's demands. And this, this is something that, um, is an idea that's been, that was thrown out through, in, through the entire Dark Knight movie is um, just take off the mask, let him come find you, right? That's what um, that's what Maroney says. And Maroney says, 
you know, essentially sacrifice your principles. That's what he's telling him. Take off the mask. Let him come find you. The rules that you established, the Joker is telling you to tear them apart. The principles, the plan that you established, the Joker will be happy only if you sacrifice it. Only if you get rid of it. And, um, and that's the fundamental problem, right? This is the fundamental problem. He's going to say, how can I, how can I keep my principle? How can I keep my strategy? Even though it has some fundamental flaws, even though, um, I don't really have the willpower, even though I'm experiencing this turbulence to get through. And, um, and he struggles, man. He struggles really, really hard. You know, there's a scene where he makes out with Rachel, right? And, um, it's a very morally ambiguous scene, right? He's making out with Rachel, who's obviously taken, and um, and he tells her that um, if he gives up Batman, if he gives up his principles, if he gives up his morals, will he will he be together with Rachel? So what he's saying is, maybe I can't take it, right? Maybe he's saying maybe I I'm going. I've established these principles. I've established the idea that I am going to be Batman. I am going to be a hero. And um, <laughs> and he says, "I'm willing to give it up. I'm willing to give it all up. I'm willing to give it all up." And the question is, why is he willing to give it up when times get tough? You know, like he he didn't want to give it up before. He said, "No, I'm going to stick with Batman." But now, when times get tough, he's willing to give it up. And this is a very morally ambiguous scene, right? It's like, why would you do that? He's essentially letting the Joker win, and um. And it's a tough idea. It's a really, really tough idea. And, you know, we don't really know how to handle that. We really don't. We really don't. Like, I, you know, that it's a tough scene. But what ends up happening later is, you know, Batman says he's going to put in, he's going to, um, he's going to turn himself in, right? He's going to turn himself in. He's going to reveal himself as Batman. He's going to sacrifice his principles. And we have this. Well, he essentially he's going to let the Joker win, right? That's exactly what he's doing. He experiences this sort of, I won't even call it a low point because this movie's so good that there are so many other low points in this movie. But Batman says, you know, his willpower is done, his his ego is done, and he's just gonna he's just gonna give in to the Joker's demands. But then we run into this one problem. We run into this one problem, and we have, well, I won't even call it a problem. I would say it's it's a hero, right? A hero comes in and. Um, and you have this character of Harvey Dent. Harvey Dent comes in and saves the day. Harvey Dent comes in and says, no, I am Batman. He says, turn me in, you know, and obviously um, fronts himself as Batman. And you ask the question, it's like, why? Why, why would the White Knight cover for the Dark Knight, right? Like, that's the symbolism we've been playing with this whole time. And you ask the question... <laughs> it's a funny answer. It's a funny answer, and it's not a. It's, it's a kind of satisfactory answer because okay, so we've established before that um, that Harvey Dent is sort of childish, right? He's sort of childish, and that he's he has all these big intentions. He has all these crazy, crazy intentions. Yet, um, yet. We don't know. He, he's a little too naive to be able to handle it. And he's going to be put to the test as to whether or not he's going to um, he's going to give in, right? Because this is his problem that, you know, he says he's going to fight the entire mob. He, he puts, uh, I think it was like 528 criminals in jail at the same time. It's like he's doing all these grand intentions, yet he's, he's not prepared for the backlash. So we could say that... He is a representation. He is the... That's a good way of putting it, actually. He is a perfect representation of the ego. Like, he is He is just pure ego. He is pure willpower. And, um... Wow, that's, that's a very, very good representation. So he is... You could think of him, therefore, as... You can think of him as the part of you that 
deteriorates. The part of your ego that deteriorates. That's exactly what he is. You know, when you say you go to the gym and you're all you're all worked up and then eventually you sort of give in, right? Because after about two weeks you're a little bit boring. I established that. Um <laughs> then you know then you end up depleting. He is the representation of that character. He's the representation of that part within you that um, that works strictly based off motivation. It's like, how am I feeling right now? And this is this is actually a good difference between the part of you that the difference between the child hero, the difference between the part of you that gets all motivated, gets all excited to go and achieve a goal, gets all excited to, you know, I'm going to quit smoking. And you take the cigarettes, you take your jewel and you throw it in the toilet and you flush it, right? It's a, it's a powerful, it's a, it's a, it's a emotional high that you get when you do these sort of things. When you have these quitting, we'll say, um, initiation ceremony, sort of, you know, like they're, Yeah, the, like they're emotional, right? They're they're enjoyable. And the only problem that I see with those types of people is the people that, you know, throw out everything and, and establish a new life tomorrow, right? This period of death and rebirth. And you're like, okay, I'm a new person today. T today, I'm going to do it. The only problem with those types of people and, well, yeah, yeah. The only pr problem with those types of people is they're not ready for the turbulence, because the thing that's operating their decisions right now is motivation. The thing that's operating their decisions right now is strict emotions, right? But the question is, what happens when your emotions turn against you? What happens when it's been two weeks and you're really craving a smoke and it's been so long and the only thing that your brain desires right now is to have just one smoke, one puff, that's it thing is, if you're operating strictly on the idea of motivations, then what are you going to do? Well, if your motivations are telling you to, your motivations are telling you to fail, your motivations are telling you to give up on your principles, you're going to give up on your principles. If your motivations are telling you to go back to your animal state, essentially, then you give up on your principles. Now, We'll show, we'll show quickly how that plays out. Let's see if I have it. Oh, I have it up here. That's represented right here, right? You have Harvey Dent, and Harvey Dent has the opportunity. This is later. It's a bit of a spoiler, but it's okay. He has the opportunity to kill the Joker. He has the opportunity to face evil and confront it and kill it. But what is he going on? He goes off his emotions. He goes off his motivations. He doesn't stick to his principles, and he gives in. But in this moment, right, that, that's later. But in this moment, what does he do? He still has the motivation. He still has a desire. Let's say it's one week in, and there's the part of you that wants to give up. There's the part of you that wants to give up, and that's the representation of Batman. But you have your ego. You have your motivations, your 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 desire, right, to keep going, to keep fighting. And for the moment, Harvey Dent, as the representation of the ego, is doing completely fine. And he covers for you, right? He covers for the um, for the weak principles that, that Batman is standing upon. So that's exactly what happens. And you have sort of this, um, we'll say, well, Weakness, right? We, we, we've established the weakness, right? We have Batman who wants to give up on his principles, but his willpower, his ego just doesn't, it's, it, he's too proud. He's too, um, yeah, proud's a good word. He's too proud to give in, right? He's too proud to, to give up his principles. And that's the representation of Harvey Dent. So for, for now, things are okay. Things are okay until <laughs> the motivation shift, the motivation shift. And this is, this is the, um, This is the part that I think everyone remembers, right? This is the part that I think everybody um, sympathizes with, sort of, because what happens now is there's an entire plot that goes along, right? You have, um, 
what exactly happened. So Harvey Dent goes in a police vehicle. They escort him to... They escort him to a different police station, right? And, um, and he gets captured. And so does Rachel. Rachel and Harvey Dent get captured. And both of them are tied to a... Uh, tied in a room that has a bomb that's going to explode in five minutes. And, and there's this scene where Batman is interrogating the Joker in a, in a very, very rough way. And we'll get to that a little bit later, but actually, no, we'll get to that now. That's a good, that's a good thing. So, so I'll I'll do it in chronological order. So Batman is, is interrogating the Joker and he loses it. He completely loses it. You know, he sacrifices, we'll say some of his principles because he definitely does. He takes um, the Joker and he throws him up against the wall. I don't know if you could see it here, but he throws, this is Batman right here. And he throws the Joker's head against the wall, against the glass, and the glass actually shatters. I really hope that isn't real, but, but Heath Ledger's Joker is just so crazy that it, that it might actually be real. And, um, and then, so, so yeah, like Batman's in, you know, he's, he's clearly in a bad place right now. He's clearly not doing too well because he's willing to sacrifice his principles. He's weak emotionally, right? And that's, that's partially because of Rachel, right? And that's partially because of, he just can't take it. Um, we'll say, when I say Rachel, I mean, he has another option, right? He has an option to run away and, um, and he, and, and he, he really can't deal with this Joker. This Joker is just something that he doesn't understand, and it's something that he can't deal with. So he's willing to break his principles, and it's a low moment. It's a low moment. So now the Joker tells him, he says, hey, listen, I have Harvey Dent strapped up to a, Harvey Dent and Rachel strapped up to a place, and he gives him two addresses. He says, address one, address two, Harvey's at one, Rachel's at two, and he gives him the wrong address, which is really hilarious, but because he's the Joker, of course, but he says, um, he says you can only save one of them. You can only save one of them. So that's what Batman does. And you ask the question, right? Who does Batman choose to save and what do they represent? So let's, let's break this down, right? Very, very simple. If he saves Harvey Dent, he saves his ego, right? He saves the car- the, um, the hero part of him. He saves the Part of him that wants to continue on with his principles, because clearly Harvey, is, right now at the moment, is dedicated to the principle of Batman. That's what he's established. If he saves Rachel, on the other hand, Harvey Dent dies, and well, yes, yes, Harvey Dent dies, and he gets to run away with Rachel, right? So he gets to live off his fantasy. Essentially, he gets to run away from his his heroism. He gets to let Harvey Dent die, and then he runs away with Rachel, and he gives up on Gotham altogether. Think about that. Think about that. He has this choice. He has this choice. Do you protect Gotham by going for Harvey Dent, or do you go for... Um, well, if you watched my Batman Begin lectures, then do you go for Hakuna Matata? Do you go for giving up on your principles, leaving, and running away? Hakuna Matata is obviously a Lion King reference. And who does he choose? He chooses Rachel. He chooses to give up on his principles. He chooses to leave his heroism behind because he's going to let Harvey Dent die. He's going to let the White Knight of Gotham to die and he's also going to leave as the Dark Knight of Gotham. So there's going to be no protection for Gotham. But he's going to do it because he's he's ready to run away. He's ready to give up. And what happens? What happens? I already said it. He gives, the Joker gives the wrong address and he ends up saving Harvey Dent. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means that no matter what you do, you cannot run away from responsibility. Batman established his principle. He established, he said, I have a responsibility to do X, in his case is protect Gotham. And he says, I'm going to run away from it. But no matter what he does, right? If the Joker is a figure of a figure of your unconscious, if he's a figure of the motivations that lie within you. The reality is, no matter what, once you establish this responsibility, you can never run away from it. 
And that's something that is vital, that is vital to the way that we actually act in the world. It's like, you know, once you establish a principle, I'm going to, well, we'll say, you know, it's, it's a very simple principle, actually. And this is what I talked a lot about in, in, um, in my Beauty and the Beast lecture, but simple principle, right? When you establish any sort of goal, so let's say you say, I want to quit smoking. The first thing that you do, and this is this is the reason why most people don't even try to quit smoking, right? Because most people don't, right? Most people, well, most people try for like two weeks and then for the next six months after they relapse, they just don't even think about it. They just keep going. And the answer is, why did they reject themselves for six months? And the answer is, because when you establish any sort of goal, you establish yourself as inadequate. You're saying, I see that if I quit something, if I do some sort of action, then I will be better than I am now, right? That's a simple idea. But then what does that mean? That also means that the person that you are now is not the person that you could be. And that's a sad realization, isn't it? Because doesn't our ego, doesn't our, you know, our sense of self want to believe that we are good and that we are doing well, you know, but there, well, there's the part of us that clearly wants to, you know, but there's, and that's the part of us that gets defensive, right? Because whenever you get defensive, somebody always it always means that somebody is doing some sort of attack on you and you're defending yourself because obviously you want to believe that you are doing the right thing, roughly speaking. And um, But whenever you establish a goal, whenever you say you're going to do anything, you're always saying that right now I am inadequate. So, um, so then you're left with the question of why then do people not want to help themselves, right? Like we always say like, okay, you know, um, never help somebody if they don't want to help themselves. And you ask the question in this case, you know, why do people not want to strive for any goals? And the answer is really clear. The answer is really clear. You know, most of the time you'll get an answer of either some sort of rationalization or the answer of what if I fail, right? What if I fail? And well, you could believe that, that, that that's some sort of illogical representation, whatever, but there's a strong basis behind that because if you take the, those two ideas and you put them together, well, what happens is, right, what happens is when you set a goal, you, you establish the fact that you're inadequate, right? That's strong, right? We know that. Now, let's say you go and achieve the goal. Therefore, you've gone from a state of inadequacy to adequacy and everything's all good again, right? But what about if you fail, right? That's that's the that's the um, reasoning of somebody who doesn't want to go on a we'll say hero's journey, right? If you fail, right? Let's say you say that you want to quit smoking and you try to quit smoking and you don't. What happens is you never went and achieved your goal, and all you're left with is a looming feeling of inadequacy. Once you open your eyes to the idea that you're inadequate, you cannot run away from that, no matter what. And, um, and that's why most people don't do it. That's why most people don't strive, or that's why many people don't strive to achieve goals that they believe that are too, too much for them, right? We'll say, um, you know, why don't people follow their dreams is a is a good general phrase. You know, why don't people, it's more of like, why don't people do the things that they actually want to do? And the answer is because they believe that they'll fail. And then they're left with this sad understanding that they're inadequate and they haven't achieved the things that they really want to achieve. Now, what is the solution? So I just gave you the problem, right? The problem with achieving goals is that, and that's what Batman sort of running into, but, you know, really the question is, what is the alternative, right? The alternative is, well, not striving for any goals ever and then just giving yourself the illusion that, that you're adequate at things, you know? It's like, okay, let's say, let's say you really say, you know, that you, well, this, this is really my problem with the, um, with the, with the new movement now on, um, on, you know, fat shaming, right? People who gain a lot of weight and, um, and say it's okay, right? And say it's okay. The reason why I believe many of them say this is because they don't want to realize, right? It's sort of a rationalization to say, wait a second, maybe, maybe, just maybe, this 
weight gain that I had here is completely fine. Right? It's completely fine because I don't want to realize that I'm inadequate. So you're just going to say that, okay, I'm adequate because it would be too damn painful to first realize that you're inadequate, then go on the crazy hero's journey. Like, I think we could really establish that losing weight and, yeah, losing weight is very, very hard. So it would be extremely, extremely reasonable. Reasonable is a weird way of phrasing it, but I'll say reasonable. Reasonable to just put up some sort of rationalization and then say, I'm adequate. I'm adequate. And that is the representation of Peter Pan, actually. Peter Pan is the king of the Lost Boys, right? What does it mean to be the king of the Lost Boys in the, in Neverland, right? Ooh, that's really cool. So he's the king of the Lost Boys in Neverland. What does that mean? He's the king, right? He's adequate, but it's of these raggly 10-year-olds, right? Forever. And... Also, it's an illusion, right? It's never, it's Neverland. It's not an actual place. So, what does that really mean? It's, it's he's tricking himself to believe that he is the king, but at the end of the day, he's the king of people who are, you know, at the bottom of the totem pole. Let's say, you know, and um, and he never has any desire to improve. So. What what are you le- what is he left with? He's left with this illusion of adequacy, and he's left as a child forever. He's left as someone who never develops, someone who never grows. Obviously, that's the representation of being a child forever. So, um, so the question is: Do you grow or do you not grow? And clear the answer. Hopefully, hopefully the answer is you grow and you realize that you're in- that you're inadequate because there is no better solution. There is no better solution. So really, that's what Batman struggles with here. You know, he struggles with this idea of, you know, can I run away? Can I just run away, ditch my whole life as Batman, ditch Gotham completely, save Rachel, and just run away, right? That's Hakuna Matata and in Lion King. And the answer is no, you can't. You just can't because he's left with this looming feeling. He's always going to be left with this looming feeling of, I had this responsibility. I had this, there was this insecurity, there was this inadequacy that lied within my home, Gotham, right? And this is a representation of myself, Gotham. And um, and you can't just run away from that. You just can't do it because you're going to be left with this feeling. You're going to be left with this understanding that you're not achieving your potential. You're not being the person that you're left with. So who does he end up saving? He ends up saving Harvey Dent. So... Brutal, brutal, but but crazy. So then what happens is Harvey Dent, um, well, roughly speaking, right? So he gets his face blown off, but right? But roughly, half his face blown off, but roughly speaking, he goes through an immense amount of suffering. That's that's all what this movie does, right? The, the, the movie, right? He loses Rachel, obviously, the person that he wanted to marry, and, um, and half his face blows off. And it is just simply a representation of he goes through the ultimate suffering possible. The ego goes through the ultimate suffering possible and, well, experiences the full wrath of the Joker. Let's say this is your experience of it's been two weeks, right? You have, you have just quit smoking. You have just, you know, um, you have been eating healthy, going to the gym for two weeks, and you're sitting on the couch and you're saying, wait a second. I really don't want to go for a run right now. I really don't want to do it. What do I do? What do I do? And in that moment, you're you're asked with the question. It begs the question, not what do I want to do, but who do I want to be? Am I going to be? We'll say, I don't want to frame it in a negative context, but do I want to be the person that I was or the person that I know I can be? And every single time you're stuck with this decision, you're stuck with the ultimate suffering that your body has put upon you. And we'll, we'll roughly say from biological perspective, right? That's the, um, that's the growing pains that's associated with making a change. When you're faced with that, which is, God, we'll 
we could really establish that that is not easy. No matter what you do, no matter what you do, you are going to experience a tremendous amount of suffering when you're in this period. And, um, well, the question is, who do you want to be? And, and how do you, how do you take the necessary steps to endure? So, um, two face, right? Obviously you can see right here, his face is sort of burning off and, um, and he loses a part of himself, right? Which is just tough, right? He loses a part of himself, which is sort of, you know, he's really known for his face, right? You know, that's that's sort of the things that we're saying throughout this whole movie is he's the white knight of Gotham. And as the white knight of Gotham, he's the one who's the public face. But now he loses that too. So it's like he loses a part of himself. He loses in, in dealing with the... In, in, we'll say, dealing with the devil or going through hell. That's a better way of, of phrasing it, right? And going through hell and going through the, the difficult trials you're going to, you're going to have to face the devil. You know, that's a, that's a really strong, strong idea that throughout, we'll say, all of mythology, you know, so I just, I just finished reading Dante's Divine Comedy, right, and it's known for Dante's Inferno, right, and I think hopefully everybody knows the, the simple idea of that, it's just Dante takes a trip through hell, and you ask the question, why does Dante take a trip through hell? This, the idea is very simple, he wants to go to heaven, he wants to go to heaven, and uh, his mentor, right, a mentor comes along and says, hey, listen, there's really only one path to get there, and you got to go through hell first. And you got to go through hell, and then you got to sort of take a circular way to get to heaven. And what is the meaning behind that? It's like whenever you go try to establish a goal, or whenever you set your aim on something, which in Dante's case would be heaven, right? But this is anything, right? It's a universal principle. Whenever you set your aim on anything, you have to make it through hell. And the truth is, you might, you, <laughs> you're going to have to face the devil at some point. So, um... So that's what, that's what um, Harvey Dent is going through right now, and there's a there's a strong idea as you sort of go through it. You know, there's um there's an old Egyptian story which Jordan Peterson talks a lot about. It's that you know as you there was a, there was a figure Horus in in he was sort of like the god of Egypt, and what he does is he essentially faces the devil, right? He faces Seth, which is, which is Satan, Satan, right? He faces Satan. And what happens is he was known for his vision. He was a hawk, you know. He's really known for his, um, or a falcon, one of the two. They're, you know, they're known, they're prey, so they really they're known for their uh, their predators, right? So they're known for their vision. And what happens is when he faces the devil, he loses an eye. And that's that's well, sort of a, a recognition. That's another representation of understanding your own inadequacy, right? You realize that you're not. You're not the person that you actually are. The, the, the ego that you established, the person that you established, that you thought you were, and that you acted out in society, is not actually the person that you are. And what happens is you got to essentially get rid of that part of yourself. You got to strip off that part of yourself, almost like the dead weight. And, um, and, Hopefully, if you're doing it right, you become anew, right? And you, and you rise anew. But the problem is, right? The problem is the reason why we don't get rid of this, the problem, the reason why we don't want to get rid of our dead weight is because for a moment in time, for a period in time, you are half of yourself. You are an incomplete being that is essentially decomposed or... Like, imagine it as sort of like a... A set of puzzle pieces before they're put together you know you're just completely discombobulated you're non-integrated and um and that's that's an uncomfortable feeling that's a really uncomfortable feeling because you got to give up your security you got to give up comfort you got to give up all of these things and that's what um that's what harvey dan and now two faces is really struggling with, you know, he's struggling with this idea of, okay, wait a second, I am incomplete, I am not the person that I thought I was, and, um, and this is not easy, this is really not easy, and, 
Well, now you're left with the question. Right? Now you're left with the question of what do I do about it? What do I do about it? The hero explanation. So the hero explanation is really, really simple. It's really, really simple. And they do such a great job here at explaining it. And I don't know if I could take you through this. I'll try to take you through it. We'll do it. The hero explanation is very simple. You find the dragon of chaos. You find the embodiment of the spirit in which you are trying to destroy. And you destroy it. So, in this case, you find the dragon and you slay the dragon. You find the villain and you kill the villain. You find your inadequacies... And you kill them off, and then you establish yourself as a new person and go through a transformation. That is Hero's Journey 101. And, you know, I think as you're hearing this, you could probably um, come, you know, come to this sort of realization, right? You know, you um, in your own life, you know, you imagine there's this lazy part of you. What do you have to do to become the person that you want to be? You kill off the lazy part of you and become a better person, you know, and, and transform. And you don't, you don't just kill off the lazy part of you. What do you do? You go to the gym more and you establish a new personality. And every single, <coughs> every single representation of the hero story is something like that. You know, kill off the hero, kill off the villain, establish yourself as someone new, kill off a bad personality within yourself and establish yourself as someone better. Establish yourself as the person that you could be instead of the person that you were. The Joker gives Harvey Dent the chance. He gives him the chance. In this moment right here, he says, I'm letting you put a gun to my head. Do it. Do it. Kill me. Be the hero. Establish yourself as the person who has principles. You said you were going to kill the Joker. Kill the Joker. Do it. And he fails. He fails. Completely. And, well, this is the unfortunate reality of the hero. The unfortunate reality of the hero. And, um, and Qui-Gon in Star Wars said it, said it very, very well. He said, hey, listen, if you want to be a Jedi, it's going to be a tough life. This is not an easy life. It's not easy to be a hero. And I've gone through this to the, we'll say, smallest degree, you know, because... I've had to experience this. You don't only have to defeat the dragon of chaos. You don't only have to defeat the Joker. You have to defeat the Joker every single time. Every time you go on a hero's journey, any time you commit to improving yourself in the smallest way possible, every time I say I'm going to do a lecture series, write a book, um, clean my room, like go to the gym, you know, establish a sleep schedule, all the stuff that I struggle with, all the stuff that I want to do to improve myself. You have to defeat the Joker every single time. Every single time you establish a goal, you have to go and do it. And if you fail once, then you start to decay. Then you start to deteriorate. Then you start to, we'll say, fall off the path. And then the only way of... <laughs> The only way of getting back on the path, the only way of growing again, is to find the dragon of chaos and beat him again and again and again. And any time you stop trying to defeat the dragon, any time you stop trying to kill off the joker within you, these parts of you that are inadequate, then you start to decay and you fail. So it's not a one-time thing for a hero. It's you have to kill off the joker every single time time now we're going to play this out now so we're going to play this out so the question is what happens when you don't right what happens when you go you realize that you're inadequate you realize that you're not the person that you wish to be you have the chance to kill the, you have the chance to be the hero and you fail question is, what do you do? What do you do? And what are you left with? I said that you decay, but I need to explain exactly what do I mean by decay? What do I mean by you lose, 
yourself and you stop growing. And it's perfectly represented in this idea of the coin. It's perfectly represented in this idea of the coin, and it's purpose, perfectly represented in how Harvey Dent plays out. So before, obviously, what was the coin, right? The coin was the, re the representation of principles, certainty, and, well, we'll say certainty first, right? And then principle second. Right? So certainty, because no matter what happens, no matter how I flip this coin, no matter how the universe treats me, right? because that's chance, I am going to make the same decision no matter what. That's the coin. right? The coin is very simple. And that's, that's a strong moral person, right? a strong principled person. You say you're going to go to the gym every day. And you go to the gym every day, no matter what happens. You say you're going to quit smoking, and you quit smoking, right? And that is, wow, that is the ego. That is the ego right there. You flip the coin, no matter what, you are going to willfully act in that way, no matter what the universe throws at you, right? Now, what does the coin turn into? The coin is turned into something that actually resembles chance. It actually resembles what life throws at you. You know, so what has he become? He has become the type of person now that is influenced by his environment. He doesn't have a strong center. He doesn't have a strong core. He's not Harvey Dent. He's whatever the coin wants him to be. So when he flips the coin, if the, if the universe tells him to be bad, he's going to be bad. If the universe tells him to be good, he's going to be good. And that is somebody who is going to fail. That is somebody going to fail. And I think I think you could, well, I don't even think I need to explain that. That seems to be something self-evident. If you let your environment influence you, you are a product of your environment. And if you are a product of your environment, if your environment is evil, then you will be evil. You know, this is something that we've, that I've spent so much time trying to understand because, you know, this is something that, God, I'm just thinking of which example to give you. So, you know, the first example, super dreary, right, is the fact that the unfortunate reality is that for most of us, if we were th a 30-year-old man in Nazi Germany, in Germany, right, as a German citizen, we would most likely become a Nazi. We would most likely be executing prisoners and we'd be drafted for the war, and we kill innocent people. And the reason why it can be explained in Ordinary Men by uh, J. Christian Browning, something Browning. Christian Browning, something like that. And, um, and he explains, Christian Browning, I think that's it but I'm not going to stick with it. So um, he explains the process in which ordinary men, you know, average age of 35, you know, mostly carpenters, mostly um, hands-on hands -on, um, workers who were just regular people in German society, weren't raised under Hitler propaganda. That was, that was before their time. And, um, and they were drafted for the war. They didn't, they didn't volunteer for the war, and they became the people that would perform massacres and kill women, babies, children, um, men, old men, everyone, everyone, slaughter entire, well, this was in Poland, slaughter entire, um, we'll say, towns just because they were ordered to, just because they were a product of their environment. They didn't have a strong core. And what happened was there were 500 people who were in that police battalion, who were in that, we'll say, group of Nazis, but they weren't part of the, they weren't part of the army. They were just part of the sort of cleanup crew is kind of a rough way of saying it. Um, they, 500 people, they, they told them up front, they said, you know, Today, you are going to perform one, an atrocity. How many people are going to step out of line? How many people are going to do it? How many people are going to say, I'm not going to do this? And out of the 500 people, it was something like 5 to 10 people stepped out of line. And 
Well, those are the people at the core. Those are the people who are not affected by their environment, but most of the people, therefore, would have been a Nazi Germany and uh, Nazi and you ask the question, it's like, are we influenced by our environment? How influenced are we by our environment? And, well, God, just look at how much time we spend on social media. That's the one that really kills me the most. Look how, look how obese our population is. Look how, you know, um, those are probably the top two. I just like look how much time or or mass media mass media is a good one look how, look how much we are influenced by the things that people tell us look how much we're influenced by um the psychological hacks that social media companies put out we are completely influenced by our environment and only very few people are um are immune to this and when i say immune to this i do not mean that it is an innate characteristic of them i am saying that they were influenced by it and then they realized that they were inadequate and then went on a hero's journey confronted the dragon of chaos which was something like social media companies trying to influence the way that you think and um and the way that you act trying to spend more time and trying to capture your attention and um and food companies you know trying to make trying to make you have the most impulsive buys because that is the way that's going to get them the most profit that they fought that dragon of chaos and emerged on the other side as someone who is not influenced by their environment and has a strong core has a strong principles and that is the representation of somebody who is not harvey dent harvey dent now is somebody who is influenced by his environment so now <laughs> What happens? What happens when you are now influenced by the environment? He becomes the Joker. He becomes somebody who, we'll say, embraces the Joker's principles. And I'm going to, I just said that in a general sense, right? I said this in a general sense that when you are influenced by your environment, you become your environment. Very simple idea, right? And that is the non-hero the non-hero is somebody who is influenced by their environment doesn't establish principles doesn't establish morals whatever they are just doesn't become or that's a good way of looking at it doesn't establish their own individuality now what does he become he becomes the joker essentially right he does all the things that the joker will do and um and that's the thing that we're gonna well we're gonna see that as it sort of goes along exactly what happens is you become a model of your environment that's a that's a better way of phrasing it so instead of saying you become your environment or you become exactly what they are you become exactly what they want you to be so like you know if we're looking at i don't know overeating right like you don't if you if you go and you eat the food that they want you to eat you don't become the executives that that I'm going to say tricked you because I think it is tricking, but um, you become the type of person that will go and be tricked, you know, and you become the type of person that will be fall for their advertisement. And that's the thing that I, that I see um, my obese, or I'm not going to say obese, I, my friends who are struggling with weight, because I think it, it goes down literally all of the spectrums. Like it's, it's more about how you literally see yourself rather than your actual um, body weight, which is interesting phenomenon that I'm not going to go into. Um, but this is the idea, right? That, that That's the exact idea. It's like, you know, you try to establish your will, you try to establish your ego, you try to establish your um, principles and keep them strong. And you try to do that. But the reality is that 92% of people, whenever they try to establish a goal, fail. And what ends up happening when you fail is you become a model of the spirit that caused you to fail. That's that's a good way of saying it. So, I mean, it, you know, the, the thing that I've tried to establish throughout this whole movie is that the Joker is a spirit that lies within you. It's a representation of the spirit that lies within you, and it, it's a representation of multiple spirits, right? So what Garfield was a, was a good representation, but it's also, you know, I could give a different example. This is this is one that um, is relevant to everybody because, you know, it's an archetypal example. Everybody knows it, you know? So someone who cheats on their wife, right? Or someone, 
I'll go with someone who cheats on their wife because that's a that's an archetype, but also you just know that 56% of men cheat on their wives and 49% of women cheat on their wives. So it's, um, and those stats are disputed, but it's something like that. And, um, and we'll go through that. So let's say you establish a principle, right? What is your principle? I'm going to get married and I'm going to stick with you for the rest of my life. Monogamous relationship. Common, very common. And then what happens is you have an affair, Something like that. Hmm, interesting. So you have, you know, Bruce Wayne goes out and, and kisses Rachel, right? And there's this strong principle that that was established. And, you know, you have this you have this little Joker figure, right? We'll, we'll take it back. So you have this little Joker figure that lies within you that says, I'm going to take your plan and I'm going to flip it on its head because there is something wrong with your plan. And you ask, what is wrong with your plan? It's this natural human promiscuity that we have. You know, that's that's an undeniable fact that some people cheat and there's some motivation for them to cheat. Okay, now that we have that established. Um, in every married man and every married woman, you have this debate that probably goes on sometime within their lives. Do I cheat? Right? Like I have an opportunity to cheat or I have an opportunity to pursue someone to cheat and I have an attraction to someone else because you really can't fight that. And um, and I've noticed this in my relationships too. You know, It's like, okay, what do I do about it? Do I stick with my principle or do I embody the joker figure within me that desires to cheat? And some people fail and some people don't. You know, some people cheat and some people don't. And... In this case, you have um, something like that's represented in Batman, you know, and, and that's exactly what happens. You give in to the Joker, and we'll say for the people that do give in to the Joker, they become this Harvey Dent figure. They become this two-faced figure, somebody that is a representation of or, or that is a product of the Joker fig the Joker spirit that lies within them, the, in this case, destructive and also promiscuous element that lies within them. And you, you could see it across all dimensions, you know? So, um, so I think, oh yes, and then here's a good place to, um, here's a good place to, to kind of end it, right? To end this lecture. And then after this, we're gonna get into this idea of Batman and how Batman really obviously handles it better, you know, and, and essentially right now we're looking at the wrong way to do it. I'll show you the right way to do it. But this is the, this is the way I started and this is the way I'll finish it. Madness is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. I took Gotham's white knight and brought him down to our level. That's what the Joker says. And now, hopefully, you have a better understanding of what that means. When someone says, madness is like gravity, all it takes is a little push. What he's really saying is, willpower is like, willpower is finite. And all it takes is giving up your ego, giving up your willpower, depleting your willpower enough, a little push to... Give up on your principles. That's exactly what he means here. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying that, well, the principles, the bedrock that we stand upon, you know, civilization is a, is a representation. Principles, order, structure, all discipline, all the things that we say are good, they stand on very weak grounds and all it takes is a little push all it takes is the giving up of principles all it takes is the giving up of the willpower to keep the principles alive to descend into darkness descend into madness descend into evil descend into whatever the either well it could be for the cheating example whatever your biology tells you to do you know for the um for the We'll say maybe for a conformist, it's whatever your culture tells you to do. You know, for a religion, it's whatever your religion tells you to do. There are all these different um, representations of the Joker. But for all of them, to be a product of your environment, all it takes 
be a product of your environment, your biology, essentially everything that you don't want because you established the principle in the first place, all it takes is a little push. So we're going to figure out in the next lecture, in the next lecture, how Batman handles it. But for now, we're going to be left with the sad realization that a lot of people don't succeed and a lot of people fail. So that is the end of lecture three.